read, if we may, if you're able to stand, 11 verses, the first 11 verses. Before I read this, as you stand, I, I realize this morning, I believe if there's every day of the church needs to be encouraged, we're, we see so much unrest. We, we see prophetical unrest. We see political unrest. Uh, and we, I believe we just need to be reminded of who, who and whose we are, amen, uh, in these days in which we live. We need to know who he is, and we need to know who we are. And that's what Paul discusses here. It goes right along with what Chris has saying this morning. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now received the atonement. Thank you. You can be seated. Pray with me again. Father, thank you, Lord, for the infallible, inspired, and errant word of God. And I pray now, Lord, that you give me the ability, the grace, and the unction now uh, to bring forth the truths that are laid out in this precious passage of Scripture. Lord, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I believe Paul wrote these things down, Lord. And I pray, Father, that we would accept the challenges, Lord, and the truths that are manifest before us. God, I pray. Oh, God, I pray right now that you'd hide me behind the cross, that no flesh would glory. God, give me the unction, Lord, to say what only you'd want but said, God, that you'd get glory and you'd get all the praise, Lord, and you'd get all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I titled this From Ruin to royalty because that's pretty much what it describes as you think about this text I, I thought about the old guy that went on a cruise and uh, he uh, paid his way and uh, all week long he stayed in his room and while uh, all of his friends were out uh, on the deck they're eating and they were celebrating I mean they were they were just having a wonderful time and uh, got near the end of the cruise and he uh, met up with his friends again and uh, they invited him to come up on the deck and he saw all the food and all the his friends having such a good time and they said where you been all week he said well I didn't have any money I, paid, I used all my money to pay for the cruise they said well listen once you pay it's all free hey I'm glad that through Jesus Christ there's not anything else to pay aren't you glad of that it's for by grace are we saved through faith we owe nothing else amen uh, and if you ever get the grasp on that you, you You'll realize your salvation. But if you uh, have the mentality you got to work for something, you're going to live in defeat all of your life because you'll never do enough to merit uh, your entrance into heaven and your entrance into the Lord Jesus, a relationship with Jesus Christ. Instead of living like kings, I see a lot of God's people in this day living like beggars. Uh, someone said that the Christian is a therefore man or woman. Uh, we live under the umbrella of therefores, and you'll find therefores all through, therefores and wherefores all through the Scripture, particularly in Romans. Uh, therefore, of, of keeping the law in chapter uh, 3, verse 1, uh, there's the therefore of being justified, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. The therefore of no more condemnation, chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, the therefore of dedication, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and verse 2. The question we have to ask this morning is, can the believer be sure uh, what he has will last? Well, Paul attempts us to help us understand that our being saved or being justified has nothing to do with our circumcision, it has nothing to do with our nationality, it has nothing to do with our race, our gender, our education, or any of the pedigrees we might have, or any of the diplomas we might have, but it has everything to do with our relationship with Jesus Christ. There's really seven spiritual blessings, seven or eight you'll find tucked away that give us confidence in our salvation. Our path from ruin to royalty can be clearly identified in the book of Romans chapter 5. 
I love this chapter. I love it because it's so, it's so instrumental in giving us victory and reminding us of whose we are and to whom we serve. And we need to be reminded these days, as we look around, we see uh, the, uh, the political un- unrest, the uh, prophetical unrest. All the things happen around us today. Uh, it just seems like it has just flooded and there's so much uncertainty. And let me just remind you, it doesn't, whoever wins the election Tuesday doesn't determine who's still on the throne. Amen? God's still on His throne. And He raises up and He takes down leaders. That doesn't excuse us from responsibility. But let me just say, don't let who, whatever it may be, don't let it take away the gloom of your life and the doom of your life. Keep your eyes on Jesus because He's the one that we serve. Amen? Well, look, look what He says first of all. First of all, He reminds us uh, that we have security. He says, therefore, being, being justified by faith. What's he talking about here? Uh, that is in the aorist tense in the Greek. It, it literally means having been justified. Uh, having been, being justified, he says. No, it's a past experience resulting in a present state. Uh, going back to a time and place in my life, the night that I got saved, I was declared not guilty by the gavel of God because I confessed the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I give my heart and life to Jesus Christ at Cages Mountain Baptist Church as a 12-year-old young man. Listen, I, I gave my heart and my life to Him. Therefore, right then and there, listen, the, the God on His throne through His Son, Jesus Christ, convicted me of the Holy Spirit and declared me not guilty. And you better be able to go back to a time and place somewhere in your life where you were declared righteous in the sight of a holy God. That's what salvation is. You today, you have security. Nobody can ever take that experience away. Nobody can take that away. Listen, you can't sin that away. But he says, therefore being justified by faith. Once you put your faith and your trust and your heart, listen, into the death and the burial resurrection of Jesus Christ and you've been born again, there you have been declared not guilty by the gavel of God. Amen? Thank God for that truth. And because of that, you have security. You have security uh, in your present state. You see, ladies and gentlemen, salvation is not about what you've done, but it's about what He's done. It's not about what you've done. It's not of good works that any man should boast, but it's about what you've done with Jesus. Have you confessed Him? The Bible says in the 10th verse of that same chapter, He says, For if when you were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. It's not anything you've done, but it's what He's done. Romans 8, 7 says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Folks, listen. Uh, he speaks here of being justified by faith. Again, it's in the aorist tense uh, in the Greek, which literally means having been declared righteous. And this happened when you got saved. It happens at the point of salvation. Let me just say this. I'm glad today... I can never be tried again in the courtroom of God for my sin. Amen? I can, and you can either. You can never be tried in the courtroom of God for your sinful nature. Why? Because through Jesus Christ, you have been declared not guilty once you've done what He says to do. You see, the person apart from Christ can't obey God's law or fulfill God's will, but the believer has no excuse. We have a responsibility. Before we met Christ, we were prisoners of our own destructive selves and sins. And the, and the sins of others caused ruin. But God gave us, and God gave us over to our own desires. But listen to Colossians 1, 21. And you who were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. That word reconciled means we've been brought back. We've been paid for. We've been paid for once and for all. The final payment was made through Jesus Christ, and it's through grace, through faith, have we been justified. We've been justified. Thank God we have security. Secondly, we have serenity. Because we've been justified by faith, he says we have. Notice the tense of these words. 
not that we're going to have peace. There's a lot of folks looking for peace one day. They're saying, well, if Jesus would come, we'd do it. No, you don't have to wait till Jesus comes. You can have peace right now. Hey, you can have peace no matter what happens around you. You can have peace no matter if the bottom falls out of your life today. If it falls out on, on the world today, you can still have peace with God. How do, you have, how do you get it? How do you obtain it? It's not by doing good. It's not by being a church member. It's not by what works or any of those sorts. He says we have peace with God. We have it. We don't have to work for it. We don't have to wait for it. Thank God you can have it right now. Amen. We have not only security, but we have serenity. We, we have serenity. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot of folks looking today, looking to an election to bring them peace. A lot of folks as we sit in this church today, they're looking to alcohol, they're looking to drugs, they're looking to another relationship, they're looking to this, they're looking to that, hoping that that will bring them peace or serenity. Folks, listen, all they're going to find is emptiness in those things. There's only one that can be found peace in and through, and that is a relationship, and that is a fellowship through Jesus Christ. Very clearly, he says, we have, we have, we don't have to work for it, we don't have to, we don't have to seek it, we have it. We have God's give it to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. But yet we see so many people trying to find it in so many other extra means other than Jesus Christ. Our whole world today is in an uproar. They need this shalom that's speaking of, this shalom, this peace, uh, this state of mind and heart. Uh, it, it's a place of relationship and fellowship uh, where life can be lived to its best. You see, bottom line is you and I, before we accept Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, there's a strife going on. There's a strife because of our sinful nature and that of a sovereign God. And the strife with God, but what does he say here? He said, listen, through Jesus Christ, through the peace we have in Jesus Christ, we've been declared not guilty by faith. And because of the strife that one time we had has ended, that strife, the power of wrath over our lives has been defeated. The effect of this peace can now be experienced. Amen? What a wonderful truth. Listen to what Paul said in Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. He says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Thank God the war's over. Amen. And we need to be reminded every now and then that the war's over. The war's over in our heart and our life. The struggle's been won through a relationship with Jesus Christ. The battle's been won. Uh, listen, death, hell, and grave have no victory over us. Satan's defeated in our lives. We have a future in Jesus Christ. No matter what happens around us, no matter who's, who's president or who's vice president or who's governor or whatever it may be, we still have peace through Jesus Christ. I see so many people today that are bogged down and worried and fretting over what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. I know who's coming, amen? I know who's coming. That's all evidential as you look around and you see the attitude and the atmosphere. Uh, but listen, thank God we have security. But thank God we can have serenity. Uh, I can lay my head on my pillow every night. You can lay your, pillow on, uh, your head on your pillow and you can lay down with peace in your heart knowing you're right with God. It doesn't matter what the world does. It doesn't matter whether it collapses or crumbles. You still have the grace of God working in your life. The war's over. We can be, we have security. Uh, we also, uh, as we, we have serenity. But we can be satisfied. Look what he says in verse 2. By whom, speaking of Jesus in the verse 1, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Thank God we can be satisfied. Why? You know why you can be satisfied today if you're a Christian? Because you have access to God. <clears throat> you have access to God. Keep in mind, the Jew was kept from God's presence by the veil in the temple. There was, only, there was places where the Gentile was kept out by a wall of separation, running in the middle with a warning of no Gentile to enter. But thank God, listen, through Jesus there is access. There is entrance to the king through the favor of another. That's the reason I love the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews speaks of a mediator, a, one, a go between. Through Jesus Christ, ladies and gentlemen, we have access. We have access to all. 
all the privileges and all the things God has to offer, all the opportunities and all the privileges He has, we have access to that by faith into his, this grace wherein we stand. And He goes on to say this, you understand, Ephesians 2.18 says, For through Him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. As I think about this thing of access, uh, by whom we have access. I've used this illustration somewhere along the way before. Uh, I never, growing up, uh, uh, I used to love to go to high school football games, and sometimes uh, I would get to go with the, with my um, my uncle would go with a guy that worked for Sunbeam Bread Company, and he supplied the buns for the concession stands. And sometimes he would get access. He didn't have to show anything. All he had to do was ride into that truck. And he had access. He could go in there. He could go in there, and you could ride in the in the bus with him. And you got a free pass to the high school football game. You got to go back there where all the food was being prepared. You can do whatever you wanted to because you had access. You got to get in there through him. And that's the same truth as we think about this. We have access, and many of you have access where you work. You've got a badge with a code or identity on it, and you have access. You can pretty much go anywhere you want to go. Why? Because you have access. And the same thing's true spiritually. You have access by faith into this grace he's speaking of. Listen, wherein we stand and we can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That we, what's he's talking about? He's talking about being satisfied. There's so many folks today that have forgotten who they are. They've forgotten whom they, whom they belong to. Folks, let me remind you today, you're not going to find satisfaction in anything today except a relationship and a fellowship with Jesus Christ. You have access today. You have access to God through your faith. Through your grace, you have access. But because of this grace, listen, he says, wherein we stand. There is a standing that you have right now with Christ, and we'll get that to a minute in, uh, in a moment. But look, we cannot be satisfied, but we can also be sure. He uses this word stand. Another, he, says we can, he says we stand and rejoice. We stand and rejoice. I thought about Romans chapter 1 verse 16. He, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We can stand and rejoice. Folks, I'm so glad today that we can stand and rejoice. We don't have to hide our heads somewhere. We don't have to crawl in a hole somewhere and be ashamed of who we are in Christ. Hey, listen, Paul says because of who we are, because of the access we have, because of who we are in Jesus Christ, listen, because of His grace, we have an ability to stand. We can stand and rejoice. Uh, that word rejoice means to, uh, to boast or shout about. Let me just say this morning, if you're saved, if you're saved today and you know you're saved, you have someone to boast about and you have something to shout about. Amen? Uh, for sure. You see, peace with God takes care of our past, but access to God takes care of our now. Hope for the glory that takes care of the future. Look what he says. When we, when we were sinners, ladies and gentlemen, we had nothing to boast about whatsoever. We were sinners separated from God. But now we can boast in His righteousness. Not our good works, not what we've done, but in His righteousness. Thank God we have an anchor that holds. Amen? We have an anchor that holds. We can be sure. Look what he says. We can be stable there in verse 3 and verse 4. We can stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. I'm glad I have a hope today. Peter wrote much about this hope. He, Peter says it's a living hope. We have a living hope. Uh, and even though if we, whatever we face in our life, we can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. I'm glad today that our hope doesn't rest in politics, folks. Our rest doesn't hold, it doesn't hold in politics. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't rest in the economical situation or status of our country. Our hope doesn't rest in relationships. Our host doesn't, doesn't rest in anything that we could tally up this morning. Our hope rests in Jesus. Look what he goes on to say. We can be stable. He says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations. <laughs> we glory in tribulations. He says, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. What's he saying here? We glory in tribulation. He uses the word, he says, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. 
Uh, he uses some words here. The, the word tribulation, uh, we get the, the Greek word tribulum from. Uh, it describes a heavy piece of timber that had spikes and it was used for threshing the grain. And what it would do, it would separate the wheat from the chaff. Uh, but he, he, he gives the idea here uh, of being under pressure here. Uh, as you think about a tribulation, that's what happened. Uh, it, it describes pressure. Uh, what would they would do many times is they would have a wheel and they would turn that wheel uh, and it, it would squeeze the olives in a press in order to extract the oil from olives or juice from grapes. So what he's using, he's using these two words to show us the experience of tribulations. He says we glory in tribulations. We glory in these times when, uh, when it seems like the, the, the weights are heavy, uh, when, when life seems at its worst, sometimes when the pressure comes. He says, knowing, and we glory in tribulations also, knowing that these tribulations, these weights, these circumstances, these difficulties worketh patience. Well, what's he saying? Uh, he's, look at the phrase here, knowing that. We have to keep in mind. We have to ask ourselves when the tribulations come, when tribulations come, are they self-inflicted or are they sovereignly ordered? Now there are some tribulations that come to your life and my life that are self-inflicted because of our negligence, maybe because of our sin. But on the other side of that, there are some tribulations that come to your, your life and my life. God puts us under the pressure. He puts, he puts us under the weight of situations and circumstances in our life. Listen, not to bring out the worst in us, but to bring out the best in us. And, and he, we find that they're sovereignly ordered. Uh, Peter said in 1 Peter 1, Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations, many colored various temptations. Why? That the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory uh, unto the Lord Jesus Christ. James said this, James said, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various temptations, knowing this, that the trying your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect worth, that work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You see, some of us can look back to experiences and circumstances in our life and our relationship and fellowship with God and we go back to times we can pinpoint some times we got under a weight. We, we go back to some times in our lives when God crushed us. Uh, listen, when He crushed us, when he, when he got those old negative things out of our life, when, when He put us under pressure so that we, He would be able to deal with the sin and the things that were setting us back in the race of God. And we're reminded because of these circumstances and because of some of these things and the tribulations that have come to our life, we know that it's, it's caused us to develop character. And notice what he says. He says, and knowing that tribulation worketh patience. You see, sometimes we have to go through things that will teach us to wait on God and not to make hasty decisions. But he goes on to say, and patience, notice how he links these together. And patience, experience. And experience hope. There's some things that this word experience gives us the idea of character that has been proved. Some of you today have character today because of the experiences you've had in your life. The things that you may have had self-inflicted and maybe some of the things that were sovereignly ordered in your life. God allowed those things to happen to develop character and to develop integrity in and through your life. Notice he says, knowing that, knowing that these things work of patience, and patience, experience, and experience. What does it do? And, and the end result is hope. You know why some of you have hope, the hope that you have today? As you look at the world, the condition the world's in, and the hope that you have today in the return of Jesus Christ, it's because of some of the trials and the tribulations, some of the failures, some of the faults, some of the experiences you've already been through helps you hang on to God and keep serving Him in the days in which you live. We can be stable. You know, today as I look across the church age and the church, there's a lot of folks who are unstable. A lot of folks are just unstable. In and out, up and down, uh, undependable. Uh, I, I talk to pastors all the time. Uh, different things that, 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 that we're seeing today in our generation. 
Let me just say, to, 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 as we think about being, if there's one thing that every one of us can do, we can be stable in our relationship and fellowship with Jesus Christ and one another. But he moves on, he says something else. We're not to be stable, we're to be sanctified. Look at verse 5 through verse 8. He says, And hope maketh not ashamed, <laughs> because the love of God is set abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. Uh, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. That's you, by the way. You put your name right there. That's exactly what happened. If you're a Christian today, he died for you when you were even ungodly. It's your worst. He still loves you. And by the way, you're here today, and you never accepted Jesus Christ. Listen, he loves you, and he died for you, and he wants you to come to him in a personal relationship. He died for you. But look at verse 7. He says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I, he says, listen, I can see God dying for a good man or a good woman. I can see God dying for somebody that might have been worth it. But listen, you need to be reminded, listen, he said, listen, he, didn't, he died for those who were unworthy of anything. He died for you. He died for me. Yet while we were a sinner, he knew how rotten I was. He knew how corrupt I was. He knew how sinful I was. But thank God, he still sent his son to the cross and he died there for my sins, and if he died for no one's sins but mine, he would have died for me. Amen? Amen? And you can put your name right there in that slot too. He knows who you are, where you've been, what you've done. And listen, he died for you, and he died for me, and he died for everybody. We'll acknowledge it and accept it and believe and trust in him by faith. But listen, and because of that, he says we're to be sanctified. You see, God's love within, his love is shed abroad in our hearts. Listen, because I've been set apart and because you've been set apart, because we've been sanctified. Listen, stay with me here. Because we've been sanctified through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. As you read verse 5 through verse 8, we, have a, we don't have to be ashamed. We have a hope that takes away the shame and the guilt of sin. <laughs> Thank God. Listen. Why? Because the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. He comes to me and He comes to you. He didn't only come one time. He came yesterday. He came the day before that. He's right here right now and He'll be there tomorrow. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. And His love, listen, the Holy Spirit is continually, listen, showing God's love to me through His Son Jesus Christ. Day after day. Understanding that, understanding that there's three things we need to realize as we think about being sanctified, set apart for God's use. First of all, in verse 6, I don't have to be shamed by sin. Amen? All those sins. What sins are you talking about? Listen, they've been cast as far as east and from west. Some of you this morning coming here, you keep dragging it up. You just keep burping it and, and rehearsing it. You keep, listen, bringing it up. Listen, get over it and go on for God and do something for Jesus. Amen? Don't listen given defeat and discouragement because of what you did back there. Hey, all of us somewhere along the way have trampled the blood of Jesus. Amen? Get over it and go on. Lift up your head and serve Him. Listen, I don't have to be shamed by sin. Amen? And you don't either. Listen, and I don't have to be scarred by sin is what he's saying. The Holy Ghost has given me a new heart, a new mind, a new outlook on who I am and where I'm headed. Thank God Jesus Christ died for my sin and he's given me, listen, he's given me and he's given you the ability to die to sin. Amen? He died for your sin and he'll give you the grace and he'll have mercy to give you to die to sin. Amen? Stay with me. I don't have to be shamed by sin. I don't have to be scarred by sin. As you read verse 5 through verse 8, and I don't have to serve sin. Amen? That's what he's saying in verse 5 through verse 8. But then lastly in verse 9 through verse 11, notice with me, we're to be sanctified. Knowing what he's done for us, we're to set ourselves apart for holy use. We're to do everything we can to avoid sin in our lives. Get over it and go on. But then lastly, he says we're saved. <laughs> Look at verse 9 through verse 11. He says, and he, and he, by the way, he uses this term five different times in, in this particular text. Uh, he, he says much more, much more, 
much more. He's trying to, he's trying to show us. Folks, there's much more, the, uh, much more to living for Christ than there is of serving the world, the flesh, and the devil. There's much more that I have now that I didn't have when I was lost. There's much more to, that I have. I'm not missing out on anything today. Amen? I'm having the time of my life. Even though there's days of discouragement, there's day, days of defeat, thank God I don't have to waller in the filth and the mire of this whole world. Amen? Much more, he says, than being now justified by his blood. I don't have to, listen to me right here. I don't have to wait one day till I get to heaven and see which way the balances go. And there's some folks believe that. He says much more being now justified by his blood. I don't have to wait till I get there when I die to see if I've done enough or not. I don't have to wait till then. He says, he says much more than being now, right now declared guilty by his blood. Amen. Stay with me. Just right now, being now justified by His blood. Right now, you're as saved as you're ever going to get. Amen? I feel sorry for those folks who think they have to get saved and get saved again and again. The problem is they probably didn't get the first time. Amen? He says much more than being now justified by His blood. I don't have to let fret and worry whether I've done enough to make it or not. I don't have to fret and worry if I've... I've sin somewhere along the way and hadn't confessed it listen uh, right now being now justified by his blood stay with me we because of his blood because of his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him wow you see one of these days you're, you've been saved right now from the wrath of God You'll be saved tomorrow from the wrath of God. And one day in the future, you're going to be saved from the wrath of God through Him. Not being good, not being a Baptist, not being a Methodist, not, not keeping Ten Commandments, not, not, not any of those things, but it's going to be through Him. It's going to be through Him. It's going to be through Him. It's going to be through His blood. And by the way, when you get on over and you read the rest of the story in verse 12 and following, it keeps talking about one man. One man. Paul mentions one man. There's only one man. It's the man Christ Jesus. It's the man Christ Jesus who will take the offenses of sin out of your heart and life. He says being now justified. Because he shed his life's blood, we can right now be declared not guilty. <laughs> we don't have to wait till we die to know whether we're going to heaven or not. Look what he says in verse 9 through verse 11. First of all, he says we shall be saved from wrath through him. Verse 10, he says for we shall be saved by his life. Time out. It's not by your life. <laughs> and by the way, when you get saved, it's not your life anymore. It's his life. It's his life in you. And the greatest problem we have today in, in, the, in, the, in the Baptist room today is understand the lordship of Jesus Christ. When you give your heart and life to him, that old man's to die. And you're to yield to him. You're to give your life to him. You, you belong to him. And he has the right and authority to lead you and to guide you and direct you and show you where you're to go and how he's to use your life because you belong to him. We've forgotten to teach somewhere along the way surrender. Uh, this thing of serving Christ involves surrender. When you give your heart and your life to Him, you're saying, Lord, I'm giving up my life. I'm giving up my life to identify with you. I, I, I'm identifying with you. You're my life now. I see so many folks today who can't grasp that concept. He says, we shall be saved by His life. He goes on and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we now receive the atonement. What's he saying here? We shall be saved from wrath through him. We shall be saved by his life. We have now received the atonement. Well, what is an atonement? You see, there's an atonement that had to be made. The word atonement, if you go back to the Old Testament, there had to be an atonement made for sin. And, and what happened was they'd take the blood out of that animal and, and they would bring it to the temple. Many of you know how, how it operated. And they would bring it and the priest would take it and he would take it and he would go through the procedures of the lampstands in different places, uh, the shoe bread. And eventually what would happen is he would get to the mercy seat 
and he would take hyssop and he would dip, dip hyssop uh, in, in that blood and he would take it uh, and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat to cover sins. And, and if you understand anything about the Old Testament uh, and uh, under that uh, principle, understand that that, that sin was only done uh, yearly and yearly it had to be done. But through Jesus Christ, uh, it was done once and for all. He settled it. He became the ultimate sacrifice for sin. It's never to be done again. Uh, by one man, sin entered the world, but death by sin, he says in verse 12, uh, as you read the rest of that chapter, uh, there was one man who satisfied all that, and it was Jesus Christ. But go back to that word atonement. He says, we have now received the atonement. <laughs> We've now received the atonement. An atonement had to be made. It had to be made. Eleven different times he mentions or uses the pronoun one in the rest of this chapter. He said there was only one that could reconcile us to God the Father. There was only one in the Old Testament. It was the priest that done the reconciliation. He would take the blood and put it on the mercy seat. But listen, when Jesus came, the very reason Jesus came was to go to Calvary, was to bleed and to die, to make reconciliation. Listen, between you that were a sinner, listen, to a sovereign God, and he took on our sin debt, and he nailed it to the cross, and he said he took on our sin, and because he, there was a reconciliation take, took place that day, he became the atonement. He became the sacrificial lamb. Listen, he was beaten him bruised and he shed his life's blood and it was through his death, his burial and his resurrection, he brought us to God and he did it once and for all and it never can be done and it doesn't have to be done anymore. Amen. Reconciliation and atonement. He says we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see folks, we can have joy today because of what Jesus did and what he's doing right now. Amen? We don't have to live with gloom and doom and worrying what tomorrow's going to hold. We can live with joy. And I'll be guilty as many of you are sometimes. You know what the devil wants? He wants to rob us of our joy. And it's texts like this that reminds us. It reminds us of who we are. It reminds us of whom, whom, whom we belong to. Amen? We live in a world that will drag us down and beat us and defeat us and discourage us. And there's not a one of us exempt from that. And every now and then we've got to go back to the cross. Every now and then we've got to go back to be reminded of, uh, of who we belong to. I'm reminded, as I, I heard it read a story, Dr. Allen Redpath had two young daughters. Uh, when they found out he was home, he traveled a lot. They would run to his office and they said who could grab on to him first. The oldest was, of course, always the fastest, and she would always win the race. One day after losing the race again, the smallest little girl cried in defeat. And the older said, Ha ha, I have all of daddy there he is. And Dr. Redpath reached down and picked up the smallest little girl and embraced her in his arms. And she looked down on the older sister, and she said, You may have all of daddy there he is, but daddy has all of me there he is. <laughs> Amen. I'm glad my father has all of me there he is. But does he have all of you? Does he have all of you? You see, if you're a Christian, Christ died for you. Christ loves you. And Christ is coming again for you. Amen? If there's ever been a day that you need to know who you are and who you belong to, it's the day in which we live. You need to know this morning who you are and you need to remember that he's taking you from ruin to royalty today you belong to the king of kings and lord of lords and you have access to him anytime you want it don't let the devil don't let culture discourage you and defeat you let me remind you this morning of who's you who's you are who you belong to amen let me remind you this morning you take a glimpse back of where you are where you were and where you are now with Jesus Christ. And shout the victory because of what he's done through you, through, for you and through Jesus Christ. Thank God this morning we've been declared not guilty by faith. Thank God this morning we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Thank God this morning we have access. Total access. There's not one single person, one single thing that can hinder us from having access to God. God's given us that total access to Him.
But let me remind you this morning, if you're here this morning, you've never been saved. If you've never genuinely given your heart and your life to Jesus Christ, you're still living in that ruin, the ruin of a separated status and relationship with Jesus Christ. You're separated. But the only way that you can find that place in God's family is to, first of all, admit you're a sinner, believe in the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus with all your heart, and confess Him as your Lord and your Savior. And say, Lord, I want to ask you to come to my heart and my life. I admit that I'm a sinner. I need you as my Savior. It's as simple as that. We've made it awful, awful complicated in our day. That's the only way that you can be declared not guilty. It's by putting your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. That's the only way you can have peace. That's the only way you can have access. Do you need to do that today? Do you need to go from ruin to royalty? You can do it just like that. It's that simple. That's simply stepping out during this invitation of the pew that you sit or stand in this morning and coming and giving your heart and life to Jesus. There's some of us this morning we've done that. We know we've done that. We've, we're trying to serve the Lord. But we've forgotten where we come from. We've forgotten who, whose we are. We've forgotten this morning. We need to be reminded of who He is. We need to be reminded of who we are today in Christ Jesus in the midst of the mess we're in today. There's never been a day, I think, when God's people need to be reminded of who we are. We are somebody in Jesus Christ. No matter what the world tells us, no matter what the world says about us, we still belong to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and we're going somewhere, amen? Don't forget that. It's awful easy for the, for the surroundings around us to bog us down and rob us of the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. Don't let them and don't let the devil do it, amen? Let's all stand this morning. Danny's going to pick out a hymnal for us.